This video will be talking about the origin of life and the geologic time scale. In this lesson, I will be highlighting the general features of the history of life on Earth, including generally accepted dates and sequence of the geologic time scale and characteristics of major groups of organisms present during these time periods. Talking about the Earth's history, the Earth is around 4.6 billion years old. The planet we call our home has undergone a series of geological and biological challenges that have changed not only its landscape, but also its inhabitants. By studying the Earth's geological timeline, you will be able to trace processes by which fossils and living organisms have evolved since the time that life started until the present day. Both the likeness and the differences between all present day organisms indicate the presence of a common ancestor from which all known species have originated and diverge from the process of evolution. Perhaps the most fundamental and at the same time the least understood biological problem is the origin of life. It is central to many scientific and philosophical problems and to any consideration of extraterrestrial life. Most of the hypotheses of the origin of life will fall into one of four categories. First, the origin of life is a result of a supernatural event. That is, one irretrievably beyond the descriptive powers of physics, chemistry, and other science. Second, life, particularly simple forms, spontaneously and readily arises from non-living matter in short periods of time, today as in the past. Third, life is co-eternal with matter and has no beginning. Life arrived on Earth at the time of Earth's origin or shortly thereafter. Lastly, life arose on the early Earth by a series of progressive chemical reactions. Such reactions may have been likely or may have required one or more highly improbable chemical events. Hypothesis 1, the traditional contention on theology and some philosophy, is in its most general form not inconsistent with contemporary scientific knowledge, although scientific knowledge is inconsistent with a literal interpretation of the biblical accounts given in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis and in other religious writings. Hypothesis 2, not of course inconsistent with 1, was the prevailing opinion for centuries. The most notable hypothesis on the second group is on the spontaneous generation, which later on became a theory stating that life arises from non-living matter. It was not until the Renaissance, with its burgeoning interest in anatomy, that such spontaneous generation in animals from putrefying matter was deemed impossible. During the mid-17th century, the British physiologist William Harvey, in the course of his studies on the reproduction and development of the king's deer, discovered that every animal comes from an egg. Then an Italian biologist, Francesco Redi, established in the latter part of the 17th century that the maggots in the meat came from flies' eggs deposited on the meat. In the 18th century, an Italian priest, Lazzaro Spallanzani, showed that fertilization of eggs by sperm was necessary for the reproduction of mammals. Yet the idea of spontaneous generation died hard. Even though it was clear that large animals developed from fertile eggs, there was still hope that smaller beings, such as microorganisms, spontaneously generated from debris. Many felt it was obvious that the ubiquitous microscopic creatures generated continually from inorganic matter. In the 1920s, 
British geneticist G.B.S. Haldane and Russian biochemist Alexander Oparin recognize that the non-biological production of organic molecules in the present oxygen-rich atmosphere of Earth is highly unlikely, but that if Earth once had more hydrogen-rich conditions, the abiogenic production of organic molecules would have been much more likely. If large quantities of organic matter were somehow synthesized on early Earth, they would not necessarily have left much of a trace today. In the present atmosphere, with 21% of oxygen produced by cyanobacterial, algal, and plant photosynthesis, organic molecules would tend, over geological time, to be broken down and oxidized to carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water. As Charles Darwin recognized, the earliest organisms would have tended to consume any organic matter spontaneously produced prior to the origin of life. Hence, the conclusion that the atmosphere of early Earth must have contained methane, ammonia, hydrogen gas, and water vapor. And chemical reactions of this mixture of gases must have produced organic molecules which could have given rise to the first living cell. Around 30 years later, American chemist Harold C. Urey proposed a model of the atmosphere of early Earth similar to that conceived by Oparin and Haldane. In 1952, he suggested an experiment to explore the origin of life under the conditions of this model of Earth's primordial atmosphere. In 1953, Stanley Lloyd Miller, another American chemist, performed such an experiment which became known as the miller urate experiment. Considering that energy is needed in the formation of complex molecules from simple ones, Miller suspected that the most likely source of energy for the formation of the first organic molecules must have been gigantic flashes of lightning that must have constantly agitated the atmosphere of early Earth. Another source of energy must have been the abundant supply of ultraviolet radiation that could have reached Earth without an ozone shield to stop it. Since there was probably no oxygen prior to photosynthetic activity. Thus, in the Miller Ure experiment, the following events took place. Please refer to the diagram. You have here, starting on the right, an electrical discharge to simulate lightning was passed through a mixture of water vapor, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen inside a chamber to simulate the primitive atmosphere. Then on its way out of the chamber, the charged mixture of gases was cooled, allowing the water vapor to condense and collect in a flask with water to simulate the primitive ocean. The collected water was subjected to chemical analysis and was found to contain many organic compounds, including some amino acids. In subsequent experiments, Miller and other researchers obtained most of the amino acids commonly found in organisms together with many other compounds. Now, what conclusion can be drawn from Miller's experiments? It's only this. Under certain conditions, organic molecules can be formed from inorganic molecules in the non-living environment. Based on his experiment, Miller proposed this hypothesis, that the source of the first organic molecules must have been Earth's primordial atmosphere. However, it is both interesting and intriguing to note the following. There has been no experiment that can transform Miller's 
of organic molecules into living matter. Then, scientists speculate that certain chemical reactions probably transformed aggregates of complex organic molecules in the environment of early Earth into primitive prokaryotic cells, probably bacteria. Once living cells or organisms were formed by whatever mechanism evolution as defined could have been underway. The origin of life is a long-standing and controversial subject and different processes have been proposed. According to one, lightning in the early atmosphere and the consequent production of amino acids when combined in long polymer chains provided the basic constituents of life. Over the origin of life, nature has chosen to draw a veil. The basic criterion in science is that the result should be reproducible, it should be falsifiable. Not one of the notions of the origin of life has led to reproduction, yet not one can be falsified. Then we have the geologic time scale. Geologic time is the extensive interval of time occupied by the geologic history of Earth. Formal geologic time begins at the start of the Archean Eon, about 4.0 billion to 2.5 billion years ago, and continues to the present day. Modern biological timescales additionally often include the Hadean Eon, which is an informal interval that extends from about 4.6 billion years ago, corresponding to Earth's initial formation to 4.0 billion years ago. Geologic time is, in effect, that segment of Earth's history that is represented by and recorded in the planet's rock strata. The geologic time scale is the calendar for events and Earth's history. It subdivides all time into named units of abstract time called in descending order or duration from eons, eras, periods, epochs, and ages. The enumeration of those geologic time units is based on stratigraphy, which is the correlation and classification of rock strata. The fossil forms that occur in the rocks, however, provide the chief means of establishing a geologic time scale with the timing of the emergence and disappearance of widespread species from the fossil record being used to delineate the beginnings and endings of ages, epochs, periods, and other intervals. One of the most widely used standard charts showing the relationships between the various intervals of geologic time is the International Chronostratigraphic Chart, which is maintained by the International Commission on Stratigraphy, or ICS. The study of ancient life on Earth goes hand in hand with the study of Earth's history. And why is this so? This is because fossils trapped in Earth's layers of rock, mostly sedimentary, have much to tell. Not only about the changes that happened to living things in the past, but also about the changes that took place in the physical environment of those ancient organisms. Scientists are convinced that changes in the physical environment have favored the appearance, disappearance, increase, or decrease of certain species. Talking about appearances and disappearances brings us to talk about fossils as well. Fossils or remains or traces of ancient organisms that lived in the past. Traces include footprints, burrows, tools of humans, and other evidences of the existence of ancient organisms. Remains include body parts or entire bodies that have been preserved. Some fossils consist of the original hard parts of the body, such as shells and teeth. Some remains have actually turned into stone or became petrified or fossilized. This have happened in either of two ways. First, 
Certain minerals such as silica or calcite from groundwater may have filled up the pore spaces of the hard body parts. A fossil of this type is a mixture of mineral and organic matter. In other cases, the hard body parts themselves get dissolved and become replaced by minerals. The fossil has lost all of its original substance. Only its original form is retained. Examples are petrified trees, which may be so numerous in an area that one can speak of a petrified forest. Less common are whole organisms preserved in a medium, such as this woolly mammoth found frozen in Siberia after 39,000 years, and insect trapped in amber. Amber is the yellowish to brownish translucent fossil resin. Going back to the geologic time scale, again, this is a tabular representation of the history of life based on geologists' study of rocks and the fossils they contain. All the pieces of information about Earth are arranged chronologically from the oldest to the most recent. The oldest is at the bottom of the table, while the most recent is at the top of the table. Consequently, the geologic time scale is read from the bottom up. As shown, the first column gives the major divisions of time from the oldest to the most recent. We have Hadean, Archaean, Proterozoic, and the Phanerozoic Eon. The second column gives the second major division, the eras, from Precambrian up to the Cenozoic era. The third column gives the divisions of an era. It's the periods we have from Cambrian up to the Quaternary period. The fourth column gives us the divisions of periods. We have the epochs from Paleocene up to Holocene epoch. It's the epoch we are in right now. Some illustrations have forms of life found in the rock layers as revealed by fossil records such as this one. First we have to discuss is the Precambrian life. The Precambrian life composed of the Hadean, Archaean, and Proterozoic era started more than 550 million years ago. This covers approximately 88% of the Earth's history. It started with the planet's creation about 4.5 billion years ago from dust and gas orbiting the sun and ended with the emergence of complex multi-celled organisms almost 4 billion years later. It is during this time that the Earth was transformed from a ball of gas and dust to liquid rock enveloped with hot, non-breathable gases mostly composed of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and sulfur. The molten rock cooled down from the Earth's crust and with that, the gases also changed, providing a cooler atmosphere composed mostly of nitrogen. The Earth became more conducive to life and allowed single-celled cyanobacteria to exist. The earliest life comprising Precambrian biota was long believed to include tiny, sessile, soft-bodied sea creatures. However, recently there has been increasing scientific evidence suggesting this time and possibly even before the Ejacaran period. The latter part of Precambrian life, we have the Proterozoic era, was greatly affected by the movement of the tectonic plates forming the supercontinent Rodinia. It's the Earth's core and atmosphere cooled down and brought about the ice ages. The production of oxygen of the primitive cyanobacteria caused a drastic change in the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. Many species of bacteria and protists were killed by the presence of oxygen. 
This allowed the domination of aerobic eukaryotes, the first multicellular organisms. Cyanobacteria live in many environments, the same as eukaryotic algae. The Phanerozoic eon is shown along the top left side of this figure and represents the time during which the majority of macroscopic organisms, algal, fungal, plant, and animal lived. When first proposed as a division of geologic time, the beginning of the Phanerozoic was thought to coincide with the beginning of life. In reality, this eon coincides with the appearance of animals that evolved external skeletons like shells and the somewhat later animals that formed internal skeletons such as the bony elements of vertebrates. The time before is usually referred to as the Precambrian and exactly what qualifies as an eon or era very somewhat depending on whom you talk to. In any case, the Precambrian is usually divided into the three eras as shown. The Phanerozoic consists of three major divisions, the Cenozoic, Mesozoic, and the Paleozoic eras. The Zoic part of the word comes from the root zoo, which means animal. Sen means recent. Meso means middle and palio means ancient. These divisions reflect major changes in the composition of ancient faunas, each era being recognized by its domination by a particular group of animals. The Cenozoic has something been called the age of mammals, the meso age of dinosaurs and palio the age of fishes. The Paleozoic era, known as the Age of Fishes, lasted for more than 300 million years. This era is divided into six geologic periods, the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian. This era began with the breakup of the supercontinent Rodinia into continents Gondwana and Laurentia. Laurentia and Gondwana were continents located near the equator that subsumed much of the current day land masses in a different configuration. At this time, sea levels were very high, probably at the level that hasn't been reached since. As the Paleozoic progressed, glaciations created a cool global climate, but conditions warmed near the end of the first half of the Paleozoic. During the latter part of the Paleozoic, the land masses began moving together. Eventually, a single supercontinent called Pangaea was formed in the latter part of the Paleozoic. Glaciations then began to affect Pangaea's climate, affecting the distribution of animal life. The Cambrian period is characterized by lowlands, extensive seas, mountain building, have mild climate, abundant marine algae, and invertebrates including trilobites. Most of present major phyla were represented. Trilobites, by the way, are a group of extinct marine arthropods. The Ordovician period is characterized by submergence and emergence of lands, mountain building, you have warm climate, mild at the poles, increasing forms of marine life, marine algae, corals and sea stars, and the first vertebrates or early fishes. It was long thought that the first true vertebrates, the fishes, you have ostracderms, appeared in our division, and the very first nastostom or jawed fish appeared in the late Ordovician. The Silurian is characterized by shallow seas, extensive mountain building, mild climate, and appearance of first land plants, first land animals such as millipedes, centipedes, and the earliest arachnids. Abundant corals and other marine vertebrates, which includes graptolites, 
conodonts, and mollusks. The Devonian period is characterized by the emergence of lands, shallow seas formation, and drying of great swamps, warm and humid climate over the world. Also have horse tails and tree ferns are abundant. The first swamp forests, spread of bony fishes and sharks, first amphibians, and spread of vertebrates to land. The Carboniferous period is divided into two, namely the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. The spread of insects and amphibians, such as Amphibamus grandiceps, are shown. We also have abundant sharks and echinoderms, as well as the formation of coal forests. It occurred during the Mississippian, while abundant, while abundant plants Large insects, abundant amphibians, and the first reptiles appeared during the Pennsylvanian. The earliest known reptile is Hylonomus layeli, which lived about 315 million years ago. The Permian period is characterized by extensive swamps, which dried later. Emergence of lands, mountain building, glaciation in southern hemisphere, varied climate over the earth, sweeping out of swamps, first cycads, increase in variety of reptiles, disappearance of trilobites and other invertebrates. This era started around 245 million years ago and lasted for 180 million years. It is subdivided into three periods, namely Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. Movement of the tectonic plates was milder during this era. The most significant landmass activity was the gradual rifting of the supercontinent Pangaea. This split of Pangaea into a northern continent Laurasia and the southern continent Gondwana. This created the passive continental margin that characterizes most of the Atlantic coastline. By the end of this era, the continents had rift into nearly their present form. Laurasia became North America and Eurasia, while Gondwana split into South America, Africa, Australia, Antarctica, and the Indian supercontinent. The first period of the Mesozoic era is the Triassic. It is characterized by high lands, many deserts, extensive seas, tropical and subtropical warm climate, abundant gymnosperms, appearance of seed ferns, also have first dinosaurs, the Plachiosaurus, swimming and mammal-like reptiles, decrease in number of marine invertebrates. Jurassic period is characterized by low lands, extensive seas in swamp, mountain building, warm climate, first century sperms, abundant gymnosperms, Abundant gymnosperms, first mammals, you have the Morganocodontids, first birds, the Archaeopteryx, spread of reptiles, abundant insects, and ammonites. The Cretaceous period is characterized by lowlands, spread of seas in swamps, mountain building, uniform mild climate at first, cooler and varied later. Spread of angiosperms, decrease in the number of gymnosperms, spread of primitive mammals, abundant birds, extinction of many reptiles and ammonites, and spread of insects. Though dinosaurs ruled throughout the Cretaceous, the dominant groups shifted and many new types evolved. Sauropods dominated the southern continents, but became rare in the north. Earth-dwelling ornithischians like Iguanodon spread everywhere but Antarctica. Toward the close of the Cretaceous, vast earths of horned beasts such as Triceratops, Munch cycads, 
and other low-lying plants on the northern continent. The carnivore Tyrannosaurus rex dominated the late Cretaceous in the north, while monstrous meat eaters like Spinosaurus, which had a huge sail-like fin on its back, thrived in the south. Smaller carnivores likely battled for the scraps. The Cenozoic era started 65 million years ago and continues up to the present time, is divided into three periods, the Paleogene, Neogene, and Quaternary. The world's great mountain ranges were built during this era. The main alpine orogeny, which produced the Alps and Carpathians in southern Europe, in the Atlas Mountains in northwestern Africa, began roughly between 37 and 24 million years ago. The Himalayas were formed sometime after the Indian Plate collided with the Eurasian Plate. The formation of these mountain ranges were contributed to the cooling down of the climate in this era. At the dawn of the Paleogene, the beginning of the Cenozoic era, Dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and giant marine reptiles were conspicuously absent from the face of the Earth. Rodent size and perhaps larger mammals emerge, suddenly free to fill the void. And over the next 42 million years, they grew in size, number, and diversity. As the period came to a close, life forms still commonly today filled the seas dominated the land and had taken to the air. This period is divided into three epochs. We have Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene. But the biggest development in the seas was the appearance of whales in the mid to late Paleogene. The huge animals evolved from land mammals that took to the seas. Meanwhile, smaller reptiles that survived the Cretaceous, such as turtles, snakes, crocodiles, and lizards, bask in the tropical warmth along the coast. Birds, the holdouts of the dinosaur age, diversified and flourished in the skies. But the rapidly evolving mammals stole the show. Starting from a fairly humble position 65 million years ago, Primates, horses, bats, pigs, cats, and dogs had all evolved by the close of the period. It's about 23 million years ago. Then we have the condylarth. The condylarth on the left is a hoofed animal, which is an important member of the Paleocene epoch. Then the image in the middle is a corypodon from the Eocene epoch. Then we have Endricotherum from Oligocene Epoch. From afar, Earth looked much as it does today when the Neogene period began. But looks are deceiving, I guess. Mountains rose and sea levels fell. The climate cooled and dried. Species were formed to adapt or die. This period has two epochs, namely the Miocene where mammals and androsperms continue to diversify, such as the sabretooth cat. In the Pliocene, bipedal human ancestors appear. In the oceans, a new type of large brown algae called kelp latch onto rocks and corals in cool, shallow waters, establishing a new habitat flavored by sea otters and dugongs a marine mammal related to the elephant. Sharks grew and dominated the seas once again. We have the megalodon, the biggest shark of all, was nearly 50 feet long. Meanwhile, on land, Asian and African apes diverge, and then several million years later, hominins split from their closest African ape ancestors, the chimpanzees. Adapted to two-footed walking, Early hominins dropped out of the trees and started to carry food and tools in their hands. These new species were poised to alter the planet unlikely any other in the centuries to come. 
The Quaternary is further divided into Pleistocene and Holocene epochs. Climate change and the developments it spurred carry the narrative of the Quaternary. The most recent 2.6 million years of Earth's history. Glaciers advance from the poles and then retreat, carving and molding the land with each pulse. Sea levels fall and rise with each period of freezing and thawing. Some mammals get massive, grow furry coats, and then disappear. Humans evolve to their modern form, trapse around the globe, and make a mark on just about every Earth system, including the climate. The Quaternary is often considered the age of humans. Homo erectus appeared in Africa at the start of the period, and as time marched on, the hominid line evolved bigger brains and higher intelligence. The first modern humans evolved in Africa about 190,000 years ago and dispersed to Europe and Asia and then to Australia and the Americas. Along the way, the species has altered the composition of life in the seas, on land and in the air, and now scientists believe we're causing the planet to warm. Mammalian evolution included the development of large forms, many of which became adapted to Arctic conditions, such as this woolly rhinoceros during the Pleistocene epoch. To summarize, geologists have divided Earth's history into a series of time intervals which is reflected in the geologic time scale. Geologic time is divided using significant events in the history of the Earth. Most of the representative organisms are recorded from Cambrian up to the Quaternary period. As such, puzzles older than Cambrian are rare because of different geologic events, which must have washed away the organisms probably present during the time before Cambrian. The pre-Cambrian life covers the Hadean, Archaean, and Proterozoic, while the Phanerozoic Eon is further subdivided into the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic eras. The Cenozoic is subdivided into the Paleogene, Neogene, and Quaternary epochs.